forward of the blue envelope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Don Larson in Minnesota. The Blue Envelope by Roy J. Snell. Forward. When considering the manuscript of The Blue Envelope, my publishers wrote me asking that I offer some sort of proof that the experiences of Marion and Lucille might really have happened to two girls so situated. My answer ran somewhat as follows. Alaska, at least the northern part of it, is so far removed from the rest of this old earth that it is almost as distinct from it as is the moon. It's a good, stiff, nine-day trip to it by water, and you sight land only once in all that nine days. For nine months of winter you are quite shut off from the rest of the world. Your mail comes once a month, letters only, over an eighteen-hundred-mile dog-trail, two months and a half for letters to come, the same for the reply to go back. Do you wonder, then, that the Alaskan, when going down to Seattle, does not speak of it as going to Seattle, or going down to the States, but as going outside. Going outside seems to just exactly express it. When you have spent a year in Alaska, you feel as if you had truly been inside something for twelve months. People who live inside of Alaska do not live exactly as they might were they in New England. Conventions for the most part disappear. Life is a struggle for existence, and a bit of pleasure now and again. If conventions and customs get in the way of these, away with them. And no one in his right senses can blame these people for living that way. One question we meet, and probably it should be answered, would two lone girls do and dare the things that Lucille and Marion did? My only answer must be that girls of their age, girls from outside at that, have done them. Helen C., a sixteen-year-old girl, came to Cape Prince of Wales to keep house for her father, who was superintendent of the reindeer herd at that point. She lived there with her father and the natives, no white woman about, for two years. During that time her father often went to the herd, which was grazing some forty miles from the Cape, and stayed for a week or two at a time, marking deer or cutting them out to send to market. Helen stayed at the Cape with the natives. At times in the spring, unattended by her father, she went walrus hunting with the natives in their thirty-foot sailing-skin boat, and stayed out with them for thirty hours at a time, going ten or twelve miles from land, and sailing into the very midst of a school of five hundred or more walrus. This, of course, was not necessary, just a part of the fun a healthy girl has when she lives in an Eskimo village. Beth N., a girl of nineteen, came to keep house for her brother, the government teacher on Shishmaref Island, a small, sandy island off the shore of Alaska, some seventy-five miles above Cape Prince of Wales. She had not been with her brother long when a sailing schooner acred off shore. This schooner had on board their supply of winter food. Her brother went on board to superintend the unloading. The work had scarcely begun when a sudden storm tore the schooner from her moorings and sent her whirling southward through the straits. For some ten or twelve days Beth was on that barren, sandy island entirely alone. The natives were, at this time of the year, off fishing up one of the rivers of the mainland. She did not have as much as a match to light a fire. She had no sort of notion as to how or when her brother would return. 
the fact of the matter was that had not her brother had in his possession a note from the captain asking him to come aboard and had he not known the penalty for not returning a landsman to his port under such conditions the unprincipled seaman would have carried him to seattle leaving beth to shift for herself he reached home on a gasoline schooner some ten days after his departure this same beth when spring came and she wished to go outside engaged a white guide to take her by dog team to cape prince of wales where the mail steamer might be caught it was late in the spring and the ice was soft they had been travelling for some time on the rough shore ice when they discovered much to their horror that their ice pan had broken loose from the shore and was drifting out to sea they hurried along the edge of it for some distance in the hope of finding a bridge to shore in this they were disappointed beth could not swim fortunately the guide could leaping into the stinging water he swam from one cake to the next one leading the dogs beth clung to the back of the sled and was thus brought ashore after wading many swollen torrents they at last reached cape prince of wales in safety this sounds very much like fiction but is fact and can be verified as to crossing bering straits and living with the chukches in siberia i did that very thing myself went with a crew of chukches i had never seen too i was over there for only three days but might have stayed the summer through in perfect safety while there i saw a character known as the french kid a white man who had crossed the straits with the natives late in the year and had wintered there crossing twenty or more miles of floe ice might seem a trifle improbable but here too actual performance bears me out i sent the mail to thompson the government teacher on the little diomede island across twenty-two miles of floe ice by an eskimo this man had made the trip many times before it is my opinion that what an eskimo can do any white man or hardy young woman can do well there you have it i don't wish to make my fiction story seem tame or i might tell you more as it is i hope i may have convinced you that all the adventures of lucille and marion are probable and that the author knows something about the wonderland in which this story is set the author the blue envelope chapter one a mysterious disappearance at the centre of a circular bay forming a perfect horseshoe with a sandy beach at its centre and a rocky cliff on either side two girls were fishing for shrimps the taller of the two a curly-haired red-cheeked girl of eighteen was rowing the other short and rather chubby now and again lifted a pocket net of wire screening and shaking a score or more of slimy snapping creatures into one corner of it gave a dexterous twist and neatly dropped the squirming mass into a tin bucket both girls had the clear ruddy complexion which comes from clean living and frequent sallies into the out of doors lucille tucker the tall one of curly hair was by nature a student her cousin marian norton had been born for action and adventure and was something of an artist as well look exclaimed lucile suddenly what's that out at the entrance of the bay a bit of drift or a seal might be a seal watch it bob it moves i'd say without further comment lucile lifted a light rifle from the bow and passed it to her cousin marian stood with one knee braced on the seat and steadied herself for a shot at the object which continued to rise and fall with the low roll of the sea born and reared at nome on the barren tundra of alaska marian had hunted rabbits ptarmigan and even caribou and white wolves with her father in her early teens she was as steady and sure a shot as most boys of her age 
boat rocks so she grumbled more waves out there too watch the thing bob it's gone under no there it is try it now catching her breath marian put her finger to the trigger for a second the boat was quiet the brown spot hung on the crest of a wavelet it was a beautiful target marian was sure of her aim just as her finger touched the trigger a strange thing happened a something which sent the rifle clattering from nerveless fingers and set the cold perspiration springing to her forehead a flash of white had suddenly appeared close to the brown spot a slim white line against the blue-green of the sea it was a human arm who who where'd you suppose he came from she was at last able to sputter don't ask me said lucile scanning the sea never a mist nor a cloud obscured the vision yet not a sail or coil of smoke of nearby craft what's more important is we must help him she said seizing the oars and rowing vigorously marian having hung the shrimp trap across the bow drew a second pair of oars from beneath the seats and joined her in sending the clumsy craft toward the brown spot still bobbing in the water and which as they drew nearer they easily recognized as the head of a man or boy lucky for him that he had chanced to throw a white forearm high out of the water just as marian was prepared unwittingly to send a bullet crashing into his skull realizing that this person whoever he might be must have drifted in the water for hours and was doubtless exhausted the two girls now gave all their strength to the task of rowing with faces tense and forearms flashing with the oars they set the boat cutting the waves the beach and cliffs back of the bay in which the girls had been fishing were part of the shoreline of a small island which on this side faced the open pacific ocean and on the other the waters of puget sound off the coast of the state of washington nestled among a group of giant yellow pines on a ridge well up from the beach two white tents gleamed this was the camp of marion and lucille the rock-ribbed and heavily wooded island belonged to lucille's father a fish canner of anacortes washington there was so far as they knew not another person on the island they had expected a maiden aunt to join them in their outing she was to have come down from the north in a fishing smack but up to this time had not arrived not that the girls were much concerned about this they had lived much in the open and rather welcomed the opportunity to be alone in the wilds it was good preparation for the future they had pledged themselves to spend the following winter in a far more isolated spot cape prince of wales on bering straits in alaska lucille who though barely eighteen years of age had finished high school and had spent one year in normal school was to teach the native school and to superintend the reindeer herd at that point marian had lived the greater part of her life in nome alaska but even from childhood she had shown a marked talent for drawing and painting and had now just finished a two-year course in a chicago art school her drawings of alaskan life and the natives had been exhibited and had attracted the attention of a society of ethnology in fact so greatly had they been impressed that they had asked marian to accompany her cousin to cape prince of wales to spend the winter sketching the village life of that vanishing race the eskimo so this month of camping hunting and fishing was but a preparatory one to fit them the more perfectly for the more important adventure when they reached the mysterious swimmer they were surprised to find him a mere boy some fourteen years of age what a strange face whispered marian when they had assisted the dripping stranger into the boat they studied him for a moment in silence 
His hair and eyes were black, his face brown. He wore a single garment, cleverly pieced together, till it seemed one skin, but made of many bird skins, eider duck perhaps. This garment left his arms and legs free for swimming. He said nothing, simply stared at them as if in bewilderment. We must get him ashore at once, said Lucille. He must have swum a long way. Fifteen minutes later, after tying up the boat, Lucille came upon Marion picking the feathers from a duck they had shot that morning. "'Going to make him some broth,' she explained, tossing a handful of feathers to the wind. "'Must be pretty weak.' Lucille stole a glance at the stranger's face. "'Do you think he's Oriental?' she whispered. "'Might be,' said Marion. "'You don't have to be so careful to whisper, though. "'He doesn't speak our language, it seems, "'nor any other that I know anything about. "'Very curious. "'I tried him out on everything I know. "'Chinese trying to smuggle in? "'Maybe. "'He doesn't seem exactly Oriental,' said Lucille, "'looking closely at his face. "'With his eyes closed as if in sleep, "'the boy did not, indeed, seemed to resemble very closely any of the many types Lucille had chanced to meet. There was something of the clean brown, the perfect curve of the classic young Italian, something of the smoothness of skin native to the Anglo-Saxon, yet there was, too, the round face, the short nose, the slight angle at the eyes, which spoke of the Oriental. "'He looks like the Eskimos we have on the streets of Nome,' suggested Marion. "'Only he's too light-complexioned. Couldn't be, anyway.' "'Not much likelihood of that,' laughed Lucille. "'Come two thousand miles in a skin kayak to have his craft wrecked in a calm sea? That couldn't happen.' "'Whoever he is, he's a splendid swimmer,' commented Marion. When we reached him, he was a mile from any land, with the sea bearing shoreward, and there wasn't a sail or steamer in sight. The two of them now busied themselves with preparing the evening meal, and for a time forgot their strange, uninvited guest. When Lucille next looked his way, she caught his eyes upon her in a wondering stare. They were at once shifted to the kettle from which there now issued savory odors of boiling fowl. "'He's hungry, all right,' she smiled. When the soup was ready to serve, they were treated to a slight shock. The bird had been carefully set on a wooden plate to one side. Their guest was being offered only the broth. This he sniffed for a moment, then, placing it carefully on the ground, seized the bird, and holding it by the drumsticks, began to gnaw at its breast. Marion stared at him, then smiled. I don't know, as a full meal is good for him, but we can't stop him now. She set a plate of boiled potatoes before him. The boy paused to stare, then to point a finger at them, and exclaimed something that sounded like, Uba Canuck. Do you suppose he never ate potatoes? exclaimed Lucille in surprise. What sort of boy must he be? She broke a potato in half and ate one portion. At once a broad smile spread over the brown boy's face as he proceeded to add the potatoes to his bill of fare. Guess we'll have to start all over getting this meal, smiled Lucille. Our guest has turned into a host." When at last the strange boy's hunger was assuaged, Lucille brought woolen blankets from one of the tents and offered them to him. Wrapping himself in these, he sat down by the fire, soon with hands crossed over ankles, with face drooped forward, he slept. "'Queer sort of boy!' exclaimed Lucille. "'I'd say he was an Indian, if Indians lived that way, but they don't and haven't for some generations. Our little brown boy appears to have walked from out another age. Night crept down over the island. Long tree shadows spread themselves everywhere, 
to be at last dissolved into the general darkness. Still the boy sat by the fire asleep, or feigning sleep. Not feeling quite at ease with such a stranger in their camp, the girls decided to maintain a watch that night. Marion agreed to stand the first watch until one o'clock, Lucille to finish the night. In the morning they would take their small gasoline launch, which was at this moment hidden around the bend in a small creek, and would carry the boy to the emigration office at Fort Townsend. They had worked and played hard that day. When Lucille was wakened at one o'clock in the morning, she found herself unspeakably drowsy. A brisk walk to the beach and back, then a dash of cold spring water on her face, roused her. As she came back to camp, she thought she caught a faint, distant sound. Like an oarlock creaking, she told herself. Yet who would be out there at this time of night? She retraced her steps to the beach to scan the sea that glistened in the moonlight. Not hearing or seeing anything, she concluded that she had been mistaken. Back at the camp, once more, she glanced at the motionless figure seated by the bed of darkening coals. Then, creeping inside the tent, she drew a blanket over her shoulders and sat down, lost at once in deep thought. As time passed, her thoughts turned into dreams, and she slept. How long she slept she could not tell. She awoke at last with a start. She felt greatly disturbed. Had she heard a muffled shout? Or was that part of a dream? Lifting the flap of the tent, she stared at the boy's place by the fire. It was vacant. He was gone. "'Marion!' she whispered, shaking her cousin into wakefulness. "'Marion! He's gone! The brown boy is gone!' "'Let him go! Who wants him?' Marion murmured sleepily. At that instant Lucille's keen ears caught the groan of Orlocks. "'But I hear oars!' she whispered hoarsely. "'They've come for him. Someone has carried him away. I heard him try to cry for help. We must stop them if we can find a way.' Catching up their rifles, they crept stealthily from their tents. Nothing was to be seen save the camp and the forest." "'Think we'd better try to follow them?' asked Lucille, as she struggled into her shoes, wrapping the laces round and round her ankles for the sake of speed. "'I don't know,' said Marion. "'They're probably rough men, and we're only girls. But we must try to find out what has happened.' In a moment they were creeping stealthily, rifles in hand, toward the beach. As they paused to listen, they heard no sound. Either the intruders had rounded the point, or had stopped rowing. Lucille threw a circle of her flashlight out to sea. "'Stop that!' whispered Marion in alarm. "'They might shoot!' "'Look!' exclaimed Lucille suddenly. "'Our boat's gone!' Hastening down the beach, they found it was all too true. The rowboat had disappeared." "'There weren't any men!' exclaimed Marion, with sudden conviction. "'That boy's taken our boat and rowed away.' "'Yes, there were men,' insisted Lucille. "'I just saw a track in the sand. There it is.' She pointed to the beach. An inspection of the sand showed three sets of footprints leading to the water's edge, where a boat had been grounded. These same footprints were about the spot where the stolen boat had been launched. "'There's one queer person among them,' said Lucille, after studying the marks closely. "'He limps. One step is long, and one is short. Also one shoe is smaller than the other. We'd know that man if we ever saw him.' "'Listen,' said Marion suddenly. Out of the silence that ensued there came the faint pop-pop-pop of a motor-boat. "'Behind the point,' said Lucille. "'Our motor-boat!' whispered Marian. Without a word Lucille started down the beach, then up the creek. She was followed closely by Marian, tripped by creeping vines, torn at by underbrush, 
swished by wet ferns, they in time arrived at the point where the motor-boat had been moored. "'Gone!' whispered Lucille. "'We've been deceived and robbed,' said Marion mournfully. "'Deceived by a boy. His companions left him swimming in the sea, so we would find him. As soon as we were asleep he crept away and towed the schooner down the river. Then he flashed a signal, and the others came in for him.' probably indians and half-breeds they might have left us a rowboat at least she exclaimed in disgust with early dawn streaking the sky they sat down to consider the loss of their motor-boat was a serious matter they had but a scant supply of food and while their aunt might arrive at any moment again she might not if she did not they had no way of leaving the island "'We'd better go down the beach,' said Marion. "'They might have engine trouble or something, and be obliged to land. "'Then perhaps we could somehow get our boat.' "'It's the only thing we can do,' said Lucille. "'It's a good thing we had our food supply in our tent, or they would have taken that.' "'Speaking of food,' said Marion, "'I'm hungry. "'We'd better have our breakfast before we start.' End of chapter 1